Uh, good morning. Thank you very much to uh, all the organizers. I'm a great pleasure to be here. Um, in case it's interesting, my own background, I was uh, trained as an undergrad at Cornell and, um, and then at University of Washington in Seattle, where I learned about uh, transposable elements, in particular the work of Barbara McClintock. They were really mysterious. Nobody understood them at the time. This was in the 1960s, early 60s. Um, and then uh, went to Geneva uh, after graduating uh, from uh, Seattle, went to Geneva for a postdoc, where had the great good fortune to bump into Julian Davies when he was there on sabbatical. And we were trying to do other experiments and ended up happening upon TN5, the transposon, and decided that was really interesting used bacteriophage lambda, especially throughout my career, uh, at least thinking about it, um, and sometimes technically actually growing phage and, and making plaques, and just been ch enchanted with it. Um, so this, how do I advance this now? It's this one? No. It's, uh, I'm on a Mac. Oh, OK. OK, so you probably all know the transposable elements are specialized DNA segments that can hop into lots of different sites in a genome, typically just inserting cleanly without causing deletion. Um, they're as, just like bacteriophages. They're really as diverse in size, gene content, a variety of different mechanisms of transposition, lots of really interesting regulation, different from one element to another. Uh, transposition, I think, in general, is, is mediated by proteins that are encoded by the transposable element itself, called transposase proteins. A variety of different types of proteins uh, serve as transposases for their cognate elements. And again, they're sophisticated regulatory circuits, circuitries that tend to limit transposition, probably because if an element is transposing like mad and going into lots of different sites, it causes mutation that will often be deleterious. And if the organism dies, then the transposable element typically dies with it. They don't have a good way of escaping. Um, one of the appeals from the very beginning was the idea that transposable elements in bacteria could be really useful. They could be important medically, uh, evolutionarily, for example, in the spread of drug resistance when we found TN5, and that they could be useful tools for uh, bacterial genetics. So I'd like to touch briefly on pioneering work of Barmo Clintock, who first identified transposable elements in maize, identified them purely genetically before any of this DNA stuff was, was really available in the 1940s, um, then jumped to bacteriophage mu, which was the first bacterial transposable element ever discovered, and is really a bona fide temperate phage with complex and interesting regulation, I think a developmental switch, which has some parallels with phage lambda, but is also interestingly different. Then, as time permits, uh, talk about TN5 that we had had the great good fortune to find. Um, we found it because we were studying basic problems in bacteriophage lambda and happened upon it. Um, and I jumped, um, a little bit jumped from lambda to TN5 and worked on that for about 20 years before I started to move on more to um, to studies of pathogenesis with Helicobacter pylori. Um, not trying to make any commercials, but one of, I think one of the great triumphs for transposable elements for people who are not necessarily just interested in jumping genes, one of the great triumphs has been to find that they're really useful in other ways. And one now commercial manifestation of that is a derivative of TN5 that has been made um, primarily through the research of Bill Resnikoff, uh, where it's just the recognition sites for transposase of TN5, any DNA that you want to put in between those recognition sites, uh, and then the transposase protein itself that can now be marketed, um, that is now marketed and has been used, I found out just skimming the literature just in the last couple of months by um, a genome group in, uh, in Illumina, just very, very close to here. And um, I'll, I'll cite that later on. So McClintock, I think it's very well known, she found these transposable elements um, 
inferred strictly from genetics by examining uh, wonderful variegated um, uh, kernels of corn and examining the heredity of these over, over many different uh, corn crosses over the years and began to infer or inferred very strongly that, there, that some of this color variation would result from insertion of some kind of genetic element into the locus that was controlling, in this case, um, pigment production in the corn kernel, and that the variegation would be because of at uh, different times during development of the corn kernel, this um, element called uh, DS for dissociator would jump out, would be, would leave, would excise very much, in a sense very much like phage lambda excises, and restore the function of the gene, and so you would get color. And you could uh, see this in development, and she in fact argued that these controlling elements, these movable controlling elements, were probably very important in the development, not only of these corn kernels, but perhaps in all sorts of organismal de development. And if one fast forwards to what we understand about retroviruses and epigenetic control, I think a lot of her vision now really is coming, coming to the fore. Um, anyway, from uh, Adrian Serb at Cornell and from Larry Sandler at, at, in Seattle, I learned that this stuff was really interesting, fascinating, and nobody had any idea how it was going, um, how, what, it, what it involved, what mechanisms were involved. But this, I think, prepared me psychologically later on. But let me jump first to phage mu. It was the first temperate phage to be discovered. Um, Larry Taylor found it quite by accident, as far as I can tell from uh, records both in his paper in the 1963 PNAS and also from a review that Ariane Toussaint had written, where basically they were, he was trying to do transduction of some HFR strain, some high frequency recombination uh, strain, trying to do a P1 transduction, uh, had to test the transductance where they had gotten some bacterial marker. He, tried to he had to test the transductance to ask were they carrying P1, which is another temperate phage, were they carrying P1 or not, and found that, in fact, all of the transductants were carrying a phage. They released phage when he grew up little cultures, but the phage was not P1. Uh, further tests showed that this new phage was really only in the HFR strain. The best guess is that it was probably a laboratory contaminant from some other bacterial strain, perhaps E. coli W, that was in the lab. Um, but then what would, and he wanted to, cons to avoid the problem of zygotic induction, which is if you have an HFR strain transferring a prophage into a recipient strain that doesn't have repressor, you end up getting lysis um, and killing. And so that would really mess up any kind of data that you were trying to get from HFR by F minus matings. So the great surprise, which I think set this whole field going, was that when he tested so what he decided to do was to lysogenize, to overcome the problem of zygotic induction, to lysogenize his recipients with this new phage and just uh, set it aside. And what he found was that one or two percent of new lysogens were oxytrophs. They were mutant. And um, he recognized very clearly that this would be, uh, uh, he, th he recognized this as a parallel to McClintock's controlling elements in maize. And here's just an extract of some of the data that he got, where he got different phenotypes, which were different amino acid or base requirements um, at frequencies in the range of one or two or three percent in different in independent cultures, and lots of them. So it was really carefully and well done. Uh, so this was, I sort of came in in the middle of this. I, I began graduate study in, in what, 1964. Um, and it was, we did, it didn't have the crispness then, I think, for. Those of you who are younger than me, um, imagine a life without recombinant DNA cloning, just being routine. Imagine no PCR. Imagine no high throughput long. We believed in DNA sequence, but we didn't know how to get it. Um, <laughs> and there wasn't much knowledge of protein structure, DNA interaction mechanisms, none of that. We did have um, things like picking colonies. Those are actually my hands. Uh, picking colonies. Uh, there was also other techniques like southern blotting, some restriction in the nucleases um, that were available, if you, especially if you made them in the lab. Electron microscope heteroduplex mapping, 
visualizing DNA after denaturation and renaturation was really very good, very important then. Um, so a couple of mu anecdotes. So great puzzle with mu. How did it associate? A little bit reminiscent of some of the stories about lambda. Uh, did mu kind of associate with the gene and just turn it off by sitting next to it and, and making it inactive? Or did it physically integrate? And some of the first analyses showing that mu actually integrated into the contiguity of the gene was by electron microscope heteroduplex analysis where you took mu DNA and hybridized that, denatured the DNA, hybridized it to denatured DNA from an F factor plasmid that also carried mu or bacterial chromosome and, um, and found that it truly was integrated. When mu DNA itself was denatured and then reannealed in the microscope, there was a couple of amazing features that, that showed up. One was this bubble, which for a while people thought might be related to the way mu integrated into the bacterial chromosome. And the other feature were these so-called split ends, where there were DNA sequences at the right end of the phage DNA molecule, relatively close to this G bubble or G loop, that uh, were not mu DNA, that were something else. And it turned out, ultimately, that mu has a strategy for having two different kinds of tail fibers, uh, which are encoded with, in, by genes within this G loop. And in one configuration, mu will absorb very well to E. coli K12, and, in the other, and uh, perhaps other bacteria with similar receptors, and in the other orientation, um, uh, citrobacter, and again, a, a group of organisms like that. And that uh, recombinational switch uh, is controlled by a site-specific invertase, a site-specific recombinase protein that, in a sense, um, is related to some of the transposases, but is really different from transposition itself. The split end uh, is actually bacterial DNA from the last site of, of mu insertion, because mu never exists as separate, outs never exists outside of the realm of a prophage. It's always integrated. And packaging of DNA into virus particles, into virions, packaging of DNA, it turns out, starts just to the left of the left end and packages something like 50 or 100 base pairs of, um, of bacterial DNA there, and then uh, goes on for a head full and typically leads about one or two kilobases of, of bacterial DNA there. So um, Martha Howe, early on, I think during her PhD thesis, uh, isolated a temperature-sensitive mutant of mu's repressor. As in the prophage state, it really is controlled by a repressor, in a sense analogous to C1 repressor of phage lambda, isolated a temperature-sensitive mutant, which then made it relatively easy to induce phage development in mu lysogens. And, just amazing things began to emerge from studies of the DNA that, that one found in bacterial cells after mu induction. One was that there was um, really heterogeneous circular DNAs uh, that Barbara Wagoner and, and colleagues began to identify in the early 1970s. Um, by southern blotting, really important experiment by Ahmed Bukhari and uh, Elizabeth Lundquist, uh, it looked like mu never excised as it replicates after induction. It's always stuck in the bacterial chromosome. Um, and as a control, lambda excision, of course, was easily detected, and this was by southern blotting. Um, really bizarre things that if you induced a bacterial strain carrying mu in a plasmid, the, the plasmid began to associate with the chromosome. It formed cointegrates, and induction of mu in an F prime plasmid caused the loss of that F factor to be able to transfer from the donor cell to the recipient cell, and again, due to mu integrated uh, integration into the chromosome. Um, yet another experiment uh, by uh, Michel Filin and Ariane Toussaint in, in Brussels, in Brussels uh, said that if you partially induced a mu prophage and then allowed the bacteria to, the surviving bacteria collected them, if it was an HFR strain where First, the F factor had been inserted at one site between, uh, between the lac operon and, and, uh, and proline. Uh, you could find derivatives in which the 
F factor had, um, was now transferring in the opposite direction, would be transferring an adenine, a pure E marker instead of uh, pro AB and car AB, uh, sorry, pure E instead of um, car AB early, uh, you would find these kinds of um, uh, inversions of the F factor, and they had mu, they carried mu on both sides of the F factor. Uh, there was a lot of discussion about what all of this data meant, and uh, Jim Shapiro in 1979 came up with a very, very fine, really very good simplifying understanding or model saying this is what's really happening, that you're getting mu mediated uh, integration, let's co-integration between the plasmid uh, and the chromosome if, if mu had started out in the plasmid. Uh, if you have transposition within a DNA molecule, you can either get uh, a kind of duplication that ends up giving you two smaller uh, circular DNA molecules, or in the other orientation, you end up getting uh, inversion of the interstitial segment. Here AC uh, and BD, and here AC and DB in the opposite orientation here. His interpretation of that, which has substantially turned out to be um, correct for mu and the number of other elements was that you had single-stranded NICs at each end of the mu prophage by the transposase. Uh, cleavage of the target DNA molecule, ligation by single DNA strands, and then replication driven in from, from the surrounding sequences, replication of the mu prophage driven in by three prime ends from, uh, from the uh, flanking sequences to finally give you a duplication. And further studies showed that the only way in, in which mu DNA replicates apparently is by transposition. The transposition is really a critical aspect of the lifestyle. For those of us who love phage regulatory mechanisms, it, it, is, it has pleased me immensely that um, to see this very recent paper, not history, but recent paper from Rasika Harshi's group, um, arguing that mu itself in the prophage state is really primed, it's poised between lysogeny and uh, replicative transposition, and primed in part because of the way that it has forms uh, plectinemic coils inside of the bacterial chromosome where the attachment sites are tied together by either repressor, mu repressor, or the transposase. Uh, a lot of this is driven by a strong gyrase binding site that Marty Pato had identified and held together by leaky expression of mu B protein, another transposition associated protein, plus some host factors. Um, okay, so uh, TN5, uh, very briefly, it was one of the first resistance transposons discovered, TN9 for chlorom carrying chloramphenicol and TN10. Uh, uh, tetracycline were identified at about the same time by other groups. Um, and the striking thing was that we found that uh, we found in so I had I'd wanted to get lambda phage labeled with canamycin resistance. We didn't know about recombinant DNA methods at that time, but I had decided that if we could rely on lambda insertion into secondary sites that instead of being next to gallon bio fortuitously might be next to a canamycin resistance gene. We ended up getting canamycin resistant phage, but um, it turned out that by electron microscope heteroduplex mapping, the uh, insertion, the, the new DNAs, the new phages t tended to have a uh, drug resistance insertion element well away from the attachment site um, and different Independent phages ended up having TN5 insertions in different places. Uh, this was electron microscope heteroduplex mapping that uh, Jean-David Rocher had done with us. And uh, this started us on, on TN5. I think with time running, I'm going to um, jump ahead just, and we can talk about other things afterwards, but just to um, say that the now commercial manifestation a lot of molecular biology since then, mostly in recent years, mostly in Bill Resnikoff's group at University of Wisconsin, uh, has defined, has shown that for transposition, really all you need are the 19 base pairs at the two ends of the IS-50 element, uh, 
and the transposase. Uh, Bill's group had optimized the ends to find the sequences that are best, had found mutant derivatives of the transposase that now were much more active, and this has turned out to be a commercial, um, commercially uh, useful, sorry, technically very useful trick that you can put any DNA uh, of interest, whether it's reporter genes or uh, origins of replication or tags for, um, tags for sequencing, you can put them between those ends and get transposition either in vitro or in vivo. In vitro, you just add transposase, DNA, and magnesium, and it becomes active. And, um, uh, and, 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 and it works very well. Um, so I've said a few of the things that I had planned to say. Um, uh, just to emphasize again that like phages, transposable elements are hugely diverse. Uh, one of the most recent amusing things has been finding that one of the IS elements that we found in, God, would you believe, in Helicobacter pylori, um, an element called IS605 family, that this transposes not by conventional double-strand breakage and joining in, but actually uh, Mick Chandler and, and, and Toulouse and Fred Dida at NIH have shown that this element moves by taking single DNA strands of that phage and inserting them into single DNA strands, preferentially at the replication fork, uh, by a break join mechanism, not replicative transposition. Uh, so it's been great fun. Uh, some of my mentors and collaborators, um, Dale Kaiser, with whom I learned a lot about Lambda, Lucien Caro and, and Gret Kellenberger, with whom I had worked very closely in Geneva, Julian, whose favorite R-factor plasmids turned out to be the source of of TN5 and Jean-David Rocher, uh, my late sister Claire Berg, who I collaborated with a lot, and Danga Kershalita, who found IS605, and some of the people, especially the MU workers that I had, um, whose work I had, had looked at to understand this, um, are pictured here. Ahmad Bukhari was one of the great spirits of the MU world and was a, a tremendous enthusiast of, for all transposable elements and, and served certainly as a great model for our work. Uh, he tr died uh, tragically of cardiovascular failure at the age of 40. He had been on the staff at Cold Spring Harbor. Uh, Jim Shapiro uh, invented the, the, developed the model. Uh, Louise Chow did some of the early electron microscope heteroduplex mapping. Uh, and, and Bill Reznikoff, um, again, was one of the great heroes of TN5 biochemistry and molecular biology. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>